Barlow Ivory, and I'm the executive director of Mustang Camp. I've trained over 650 wild horses and burros here. Jim gathered some horses for me in 2022, and um, they, well, actually, he gathered them for the National Park Service, but they ended up with me, and they were the most calm amazingly trainable animals that I'd ever worked with. So I decided we needed to tell people how to catch horses without trauma. Jim McGaffrey has gathered cattle and horses for ranches all over the West, as well as for Mesa Verde National Park. His most challenging gather was perhaps the feral cattle and horses in the jungles of Hawaii. He knows what he's talking about. Hello. I start this recording for the process of going over capturing wild horses. So the process of a, a group or person might would follow would might come under the first step would be what you'd call perhaps the antecedents, or at least an anal analysis of the area that you are going to uh, gather or to capture horses. And uh, part of that, the process will be um, dictated by the organization that's in control of that area such as a national park, the BLM, uh, perhaps a Indian tribe, or other, other uh, management people, uh, organizations that are in charge of that geographical area. So in that regard, you would sort of define, almost like a military operation, what area you're going to work with in the, that terrain. You know, does it have canyons? whatever, and uh, is there a road around it? How many horses are there? Have the horses been chased? Uh, are they used to people because, you know, trucks have been going by? There's an oil field there. Any number in all of those things will be important as to what tools and approach that you take with uh, this effort to capture the horses. With the idea, too, that the horses can be captured in a safe and ethical manner and that injuries are minimized, we will take into consideration the things that have happened before or the methods that have been happened before in uh, other areas and try to examine each one of those to see if there's uh, any improvements we can make on that method. Maybe there is some slight changes to any number of things that could, could happen. And, and, w and in that way, we'll be using basic behavioral science. And then also, again, we'll be staying within the bounds of whatever uh, the laws are that are regarding that organization that is in control of the area. In a national park, there'd be many more rules than, say, on a Native American reservation. So that's where we would start, and there will be a whole list of things that we're going to go through to sort of assess our tools at that point. But we're going to list all of our tools. That would probably be our next uh, step, given we've already assessed the area and we've decided that it's a certain way. But the list of tools, we wouldn't get rid of any, tool, tools being the methods, we wouldn't get rid of any of them at first, just depending on several issues. Some may not be appropriate for the terrain or the group and others maybe not legal or uh, advocated by the management of that area. The kind of two types of ways of doing that are uh, bait trapping and uh, helicopter gathering 
and then perhaps herding them into uh, the pens or traps, much as the helicopter would do. And so those are pretty much the three ways that people tend to do this. But each one of those processes, uh, if examined separately, can be in, probably improved upon. And that improvement would come from recognizing some just simple aspects to, to alter, to make your job more successful and to make it a more uh, a safer uh, place for the horses that they actually understand and aren't as fearful as they might have been in another way. I think one of the things in animal training or even husbandry is trying to understand what the animal is doing. That animal, no matter what species it is, horse, dog, cow, whatever, uh, is really trying to understand what's going on. And um, if you can tap into that, what's to do, and give them some solutions to it because of that understanding that you develop, things go a lot better. You see studies where the ones I know of where animals can distinguish faces, right? And I know, that I know that it's been done in dogs, horses, sheep, cattle, wasps even. And what they're doing is they're trying to, they can read as many, I, I've read, as 200 faces. So that's, that's an evolutionary adaption for being able to read intention. So that stockmanship that we're talking about is how to get across a message of intention uh, that they understand. And I believe probably angles are something that's an innate understanding of all of them given if you don't really understand angles well, your ability to hunt and or escape hunting is virtually non-existent. So let's look at bait trapping. Although people seem to know this, they don't always do it. It's always to put the bait out first. Uh, put the bait out first, and that has to do with contextual learning. You are making the place that the bait is a good place. Of course, most people would easily recognize this in their own lives, that they like to go somewhere to a certain place where they had good memories and in other places not, right? And for whatever particular reasons for each person that would be so, it's probably somewhat unique. But for the horses, they're rather simpler creatures, and food and water are their primary reinforcers, along with freedom. And so you start out by baiting with whatever bait that is that's the most attractive. So if it's a place where water is scarce, it might be water. And of course, water is highly motivating because you can only live a few days without water. Uh, or a much shorter time than you can go without food. You could go for very long periods without food. If food is scarce and or very low value, then putting out high value things, high value types of food could work as well. Often we've found mineral, certain minerals, salt, other things that tend to attract the horses and those things need to be experimented with depending on the sit that particular place from your original examination you may have some idea what that is to start with but as time goes by you might have to alter that somewhat so let's assume then you've baited out and horses are coming to the bait gate uh, to the bait you start to erect the trap around the bait and slowly now, your trap, 
because you're going to erect it, you've already have a design in mind. And that design should be as big as possible. So in certain places, say in a national park that we recently worked with, there was a limit to the, the size of the area that we could use. And that particular area was about 50 by 100. But if you can make bigger areas, it's better. It'll be easier for the horses to understand and not feel the pressure of the trap. Another thing is your panels ought to be six foot six or seven feet. At six feet, they tend, if they're given too much pressure or whatever, they can tend to try to jump out and often can make it out of a six foot panel. So a seven foot panel, it would be ideal. For some reason, they almost never try, but even if they do, they hit it and they fall back in the pen, where on a six foot panel or even less five foot, a lot of times they don't quite clear it, but they get it over enough and they flip and sometimes break their necks when they hit the ground. They may continue like, oh, there's more panels here, but at some point it's like, okay, just more panels. And then that's when, you know, the openings are there uh, that you've, you've designed, you've already known you were going to do that, so your design incorporates that. You also do not want a round pen. You, you know, uh, you could have an end that's round, but the sides need to be long, and there's a whole set of reasons why that would be the case. Animals are very hard to sort in a round pen. For the reasons that they're very effective, say, training horses, they're not as effective to sort horses and or livestock because of the draw that that, that roundness creates towards the center of the thing, sometimes they miss the gate that you're trying to send them out of. In really wild horses, that might not be so much an issue in that, it, well, it will be an issue as far as the roundness goes, that you may not be in the pen with them. You may have some other methods to load them out. Then your horses are being baited regularly, and this is important about the bait, which I kind of missed a little earlier. But that bait needs to arrive and arrive in enough amounts that everybody gets some. Because in the end, your goal is going to be to trap whole bands of horses. We're going to set up a trap gate eventually that will auto-close from a distance and not a trip gate that only will trip one or two or three. Now, if you have, there are several options there. If you have cell phone service, you can set it up as well that to trip it remotely, but some trip mechanisms will work as far away as over a half a mile. When using a traditional sort of trap gate with a weight and string on it, you usually only caps, capture a few horses at a time and not whole bands. So your goal here is to, from your baiting process that you've gone through, that they come in by band and eat and drink or whatever they're doing in there and eventually leave. Now you're going to start to, with your trap, to slowly close one, the, the entrances off. You have multiple ones. You're going to close them off until, and they you know, as they get used to this and they get conditioned to coming, and they'll usually get conditioned to coming by, you know, the presence of the truck or whatever's bringing that, that attractant, the water, the food, the mineral, whatever. So that's their cue to show up at the trap. Eventually, then, you get the trap down to one entrance and one, one entrance and one way out. That's going to be important because when they are trapped and it's time to load them out, they're going to want to go out in the same direction that they came in. And that's also going to be your trap gate auto-close. So once that starts to happen, they, perhaps there's multiple bands around. 
of these horses that are taking the bait. Now, within the band dynamic, find that, you know, there's going to be a dominant band that kind of runs the other bands, and they'll probably always come in first. But if there's enough attractant in there, the others learn over time to wait their turn. And, and usually their turn is in the order of sort of the hierarchy of, of, uh, of what's going on in that, in that geographical area. And so one will leave and the other will come in, and one will leave and the other one will come in. And as long as there's enough bait in there to feed everybody, then that, that keeps happening. They're, they're assured that they get rewarded for their patience, essentially. That process is worked out among the bands. You really have nothing to do with it other than keep that bait coming. Uh, bait horses like mares, uh, maybe in season or something that, but of course that's another uh, reinforcer, reproduction. But again, making that gets a little harder if you're baiting first. So that's not a highly effective thing as far as I can tell. I mean, it's not bad, but it depends on how you work out the trap and so forth. Of course, you're reading animal behavior all the time, whether it's from the beginning when you're baiting them, uh, what they're actually doing, uh, how they're interacting with each other, their level of what you'd call homeostasis, or the stockman may consider it just keeping them in a normal frame of mind. So behaviorists would call that uh, being in a homeostasis kind of place. You know, you're not pushing those limits of, I got to get out of here. You're essentially cognitive. You're in a cognitive state. I can solve this problem of the pressure. I can solve this problem. If you can maintain that, that really keeps horses from running into the panels and breaking their necks and the things that often happen. As you bait, for instance, using good stockmanship of, say, when they come in, they may, be, they may be really want to come in to the baiting, but you're too close or you're too something. So you maybe relieve that pressure. You reckon, you know, there's, there's different zones, of course, one of them being the flight zone. Others are the recognition zone and, and, and some other aspects to that and then you would be using some of those techniques you know if you were the the person baiting and in so doing you would be also teaching the horses how to remove the pressure uh, to essentially take some pressure and that it wasn't wasn't a fearful thing which will come in later in the loadouts and perhaps the processing that needs to be done in a holding facility so this whole thing is, uh, I guess, a holistic approach in that it's not just one thing. It's just not just one thing. We're going to go bait trap today and uh, we're going to catch some, you know. Uh, it ain't like that. So, uh, But when you do get that, you start to get horses that are essentially a little tamer. They understand what's going on. You know, they're... they're more or less willing to cooperate if you can get that across. You know, some things uh, not to do is small traps, round pins, narrow, long traps, and then make sure that you bait first. Although people seem to know this, they, they build the trap first. And they build really small traps, and they are often round. And then they're almost like a maze to get in, to get out, and they end up trapping a few sometimes. But, you know, not, you know, whole numbers or bands. And it makes it hard for the horse to actually go in there unless he really, really, whatever that primary reinforcer is in there actually needs it in order to survive. Helicopter gathering, uh, we've mentioned maybe that it can be used with, and in a way that we would call uh, using the helicopter with uh, better stockmanship rules and techniques. Those 
things that would have to change are, are, are many in that uh, your goal of gathering multiple bands at once into the same trap would, would have to be uh, eliminated and use the helicopter in a way that we might uh, elaborate on later on of how to do that, uh, of that only a band at a time was gathered. And if that was the case, then the traps themselves would have to be altered as well. Now, the reason why you don't want to gather all those bands at once is because it's not, it's not something bands do. They do not mix out there. They have their own spaces. Studs, yes, do fight over trying to steal a mare or protect their own mares, but the bands themselves do not mix together. And so those bands are generally somehow related, family bands, you could say, or at least closely related. And they, they don't want to go somewhere else with other their, their group. And one of the techniques that is currently used or processes is that all these multiple bands are forced together all at once, and then they're sorted by sex and uh, that means that many different bands are now together, and it's a, it's a formula for, for adversive behaviors amongst the bands. Fear, uh, the only way you can actually do that because they don't want to leave their, their group people, whoever that is, is to add more pressure, more coercion, and then, of course, when you do that and you actually get them off, their arousal is very high. They're very afraid. A behavioral rule uh, that we try to understand is that fear learning is permanent. And in this case, that would mean their association with people and other things would have some negative consequence in the future. Of course, it'll vary for each horse, but still there's probably better ways to go about it to avoid that whole scenario. We've come across this thing now called stockmanship, and, and one of the third methods of uh, gathering these horses is using that uh, out in the range to bring them in, as opposed to the helicopter and the, or the attractant. Now, if the horses have been chased, like in many places, they get chased, then that becomes pretty difficult because they start to associate people with, with you know, danger. They're going to chase me, and so they take off, and they're gone before you can even, you know, get on your horse or whatever you're using to, uh, to herd them. We are advocates of Bud Williams' stockmanship methods. You could argue uh, why they're very effective. They have specific how you take the angles and approaches, specific methods for certain things. And uh, none of those things are really adhered to in the loadout procedures that are generally conducted by uh, the captures. And that's really when the the injuries occur. And because they're the same, the loadout procedures are generally the same, of course the death rate and injury rate is more or less the same. It's not because of the bait trapping or the helicopter gathering. It's mo more or less how they handle them afterwards. Now, as this process goes on, say, uh, and you can get closer to the horses, whether that be because they are in small areas and they were used to people from campgrounds or watering or they came into traps, you can start to use PCP or some birth control method to then control animal po uh, horse populations so that the numbers do not go beyond what the carrying capacity of that particular area is. Of course, that's after you've got those numbers down to 
to again the, the carrying capacity number for that geographical area. The BLM tends to call that uh, AML, accepted management level. Biologists, I think, you know, are in the carrying capacity. It's broken down into AUs. It's calculated on how much forage is out there, how much water is out there, and then what all should be out there that eats this stuff. What is the shared thing? And that might be elk, deer, antelope, cattle, horses, burrows, any number of things, and prairie dogs. I mean, it all goes the, uh, bison. They all, they all eat the same more or less thing, and so that limits the number of animal units you can carry on that area. And that's really important to maintain the habitat of that area because as anyone that's watched any of the nature programs that are on TV, they almost always mention the loss of habitat. And then in the West, when in primarily where these horses are roaming in the West, but not universally so, you see that it's in a very dry area and we're experiencing desertification that is accelerating from both climate change and overuse, overgrazing from that. Those are important aspects of that and all of these techniques are management techniques to enhance essentially the environment and then at the same time treat the horses in an ethical way methods that we know work from a behavioral sense. We've studied these things, not necessarily me, but many people over a long period of time. It's just how it is, how nature set things up. Bait trapping is certainly a very uh, useful tool, but again, it's not just bait trapping in the old way they used to do it for a hundred years or more, but we're gonna go about this sequentially. All right, any questions, uh, give me a call, bye.